All right, welcome back to Problem Solver Politics. Continuing the tradition, we are going to analyze every single one of the 73 points on Andrew Yang's presidential platform for 2020. Cody, which one are we going over today? All right. Uh, in the past, we've gone over some of the more, I don't know, I want to say serious, but some of the more, I mean, universal basic income is a pretty big deal, uh, border policy. Yeah. However, today I want to get into something that it's very, it's an issue that I find very important. It's a, I think, I, I'm not a big fan of the word, but I think it's one gaming of Gaming rights, online gaming rights. No, no, rights. no. But it's one of the few legitimate, what I would call, injustices going on in the world today that I care about. Okay. Uh, it's a bit silly, but I do think it matters. And what it is, is Andrew Yang actually has detailed on his website. His policy for the NCAA paying athletes. Here's the brief. Star student athletes are told that they should be grateful they are receiving a free education. Meanwhile, schools generate tens of millions in revenue and corporate sponsorship and coaches and athletic directors are paid multiple millions of dollars because of their athletic exploits. Just an aside here, Nick Saban, head coach of uh, Alabama's football team, which is a public university, I think is the highest paid public official in the state. Uh, NCAA should accept the reality that cer certain of its sports have become entertainment properties and the athletes should be compensated accordingly. This is particularly true for Division I men's football and men's basketball. We should create a new type of college athlete, a performer athlete, who is entitled to market-based compensation. This would not affect the status of any other student athlete, nor the tax-exempt status of the university. However, each university with a performer athlete would be required to start an affiliated taxable for-profit entity through which both corporate sponsorships and performer athlete salaries would flow. Paying athletes in certain sports would lead to more resources going to the players who are both the main attraction and putting their bodies in the line each game. Wow, that's a lot to unpack there. If I were to put this into one sentence, basically he's pointing out that some of these college sports programs have gotten so large they've created their own economies and the players and the attraction that the players become themselves are a part of those economies so the players should be compensated on an economy or market-based, not platform, but strategy instead of just getting their free education? Yeah, I mean, basically, it's, it's March and we're filming this, uh, March Madness. I'm sure every, a lot of people are familiar with the term March Madness. Yeah. Uh, it's a big college basketball tournament, Division One men's tournament. It's going to be broadcasted, I think, simultaneously on three different national networks, and none of the athletes will receive a dime for it. They'll receive an education, but guess what? There's a lot of kids getting their education paid for at the state, and they go to the same school. Well, and then, yes, I, I see how the coaches can get paid because they, you know, that they're but they're public officials because these are public schools. Okay. So I guess my initial reaction to this is twofold. I will neither reject it nor accept it. I'm thinking there's many parts about Title IX that were good, but there's also been many ways that Title IX has been abused. How do you make sure that this doesn't become another Title IX thing? I will tell you, however, I completely agree with anything that encourages compensation to be market-based. Yeah, one thing I think is a little interesting, too, he's kind of sticking his neck out here a bit on this platform. It doesn't seem like it, but as he outlined in there, really this is going to apply to Division One men's football and Division One men's basketball. Really, that's what it's going to apply to. And even then, it's going to apply to maybe 1% of the athletes. Majority of NCAA athletes are playing volleyball, swim, golf, tennis. I mean, <laughs> or they're getting paid to make it onto the rowing team in that extra slot that's unfulfilled, so they go into Harvard, right? <laughs> exactly. But get this. I mean, this is, um again, I want to bring back to this. Uh, Nick Saban is the head coach of Alabama's football team. Okay. In 2017, guess what his guaranteed pay was? 2017, Alabama. Man, that's the big, that's Crimson Tide State, if I'm correct, right? Biggest biggest school in the, in the nation for football. Biggest school in the nation for football. Pass, I would go four or five million. You weren't even close. Uh, no. Eleven point one million. Eleven million. That was for 2017. And that's guaranteed. If they win, there's bonuses, right? Oh, you want to read the incentives? What are the pension bonus? Four hundred thousand dollars at the end of 2017, 18, 22, 23, and 24 seasons, just for being the coach. Uh, if he makes it to 2019, 2020 specifically, another eight hundred grand in his pocket. And then three point six million in incentives if he makes it to all the way to the tw 2021 season. So kind of lay this out 2017 400 grand 2018 400 grand 2019 800 grand 2020 800 grand 2021 3.6 million and then 22 23 and 24 another 400 grand 
And I don't want to make this a rag on uh, Nick Saban, which, by the way, he also gets a 25 hours of private jet use, membership at a, co- at a country club, 15 skybox seats, an additional 12 tickets for home games, two cars with insurance, and a $100,000 academic bonus if graduation rate is top four in the SEC, which I just want to highlight that. It's a big one. If his school is in leading their conference, which is a dozen schools or so, in graduation, he gets 100 grand. If he just isn't fired at the end of this season, he gets 800 grand. And so now, so now to, to, to go back to Cody, Andrew, we got to the wrong profession. We didn't. But to go back to Andrew Yang again, one of the, one of the things that really interests me about this is he says the guiding principles are fairness, equity, and truth. We hear that all the time from people on the left. Okay, but hold on a second. I really bristle when people say, oh, fairness, equity, and truth, because you need to define that. If we're talking about equity of opportunity, yes, I'm all about equality of opportunity. I'm all about fairness in how we present people with those opportunities. But I'm not all about fairness of outcome. But this doesn't seem like fairness of outcome. No, no. uh, It seems like he's literally saying that if we're making money for the economy of this school sports program that's generating millions, then these guys should have a cut of it as well. And gosh, I don't have too much of a problem with that. What would the conservative – I mean, he's reg- – this is what this is what's so weird about Andrew Yang is he's registering – or he's already registered, and he's competing as a Democrat, but a lot of these ideals actually seem pretty conservative, saying, hey, everybody should get a piece of the pie and access to capital. I mean, that's – this is a total capitalist idea. The Democrats are going to come after him with, a, like, a ton of bricks. When you start saying – that an athlete can come in and say, oh, look, I took us an extra two steps into March Madness. I'm worth 500 grand a year. All of a sudden, these schools are going to have to compete in a way they never have before. This is going to do more than throw a monkey wrench into the system. This is going to make the NCAA almost its own professional farm team. Well, I think that would be the big pushback is, is the implications to it. However, I just want to point out Zion Williamson. He's the most popular uh, men's Division One college basketball player right now. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to pull this up. It's a video on YouTube with Zion Williamson. I just want to highlight something. Uh, it's published by ESPN, and it has 1.3 million views. Okay. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, 1.3 million views on YouTube. There's some financial company. You make money. They run oh, ads on that. Uh, Zion sees none of that. And I get that, you know, you don't get, Kobe Bryant doesn't get money for Kobe Bryant highlights. And why aren't they getting money, though? Because aren't there NCAA rules that prohibit it? it, it especially in when it came to men's Division One football, it got to the point where uh, schools could provide snacks, but they couldn't provide meals, and the absurdity of that came to a head when a, a bagel was a snack, a bagel with cream cheese was a meal. Um, <laughs> and, th- and, again, this is, again, this is a— uh, But isn't this, is he, isn't the problem that he's fighting against governmental intervention— or regulation, and all he's really doing is suggesting that we get rid of the regulations that prohibit meals instead of snacks, get rid of the regulations that prohibit pay for NCAA players instead of not having NCAA pay, uh, players. This almost smacks of deregulation. Oh, 100%. I mean, realistically, here's the, as president, I will. He says, as president, I will ensure that the NCAA modernizes by agreeing to compensate star athletes who drive significant revenues to their institutions at appropriate levels. Don't let the schools fool you. There is a direct line between results in football and basketball and enrollment numbers. People want to go to Alabama if that's where the star players yeah, play. Yeah, I mean, these 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 schools are cleaning up. And anybody that thinks that these universities, just because they're 501c3s, aren't profit-generating institutions that operate just like a large publicly traded corporation, uh, you're, you're nuts. I mean— the fact that a coach can get compensated that much. Obviously, I, I don't have a problem with that much compensation because, to be honest with you, uh, what's keeping these guys from going in and going into the pros or using their talents elsewhere? I'm okay with I'm okay with coaches making these exorbitant uh, amounts of money because they draw in the talent and they run the talent. But Dennis Prager, one of the most conservative commentators out there, has a phrase that I love. That conservatives don't have a problem with how much money the wealthy make as long, not sorry, conservatives, most people don't have a problem with how much money the wealthy make as long as the poor live decently. We don't care how much those on top make as long as those on bottom have a good life. And it looks like 
this is a good example of where some improvements could be made. And I haven't heard anybody talking about this except for Andrew Yang. No, yeah. This is knocking my socks off. And just a really quick aside before we're running out of time here, but um, one of the most important things to me about this, because like I said, I'm not a big, oh, inequality, oh, injustices, but this is one of the most frustrating things. There's been players in the past who have had like their scholarships come into question and stuff because they sold uh, – Famously, there was players who traded their championship rings for tattoos. That was a no-no. Oh, uh, one of the easiest ways to fix this, remove, the, remove the restrictions on amateur athletes making money through autographs, merchandise sales, and other common means. Where this really fascinates me in the context of Andrew Yang is here's a guy running on universal basic income, probably one of the most socialist policies there is. Um, but the more you go through line by line what he believes in, this is capitalism. This is a hundred percent. Yeah. Is a man not, you know, entitled He's to in the, the fruit of his party. labor? I mean, this is exact. Well, I don't know if he doesn't want to primary the president or if he's waiting to sneak in as more democratic means. Again, we'll get into it in another video. He's not the most friendly on the Second Amendment. He's not the least friendly, but he's not the most friendly on the Second Amendment. Uh, okay. He's big on the first, but for right now, he at the very least believes that a man is entitled to the product of his, you know, hard work, and that's great to me. Okay, so the primary reaction of problem solver politics to pain NCAA athletes so far, I believe, is a thumbs up. More on Andrew Yang's platform coming up. This is Problem Solver Politics.